body had the antibodies, not the virus. Now, I'm not a scientist, but somewhere from the caverns of memory, I seem to recall from biology classes that the presence of antibodies indicated that the body had fought off infection. As I listened, I also heard that some scientists um, believed that the virus did not cause AIDS. I was fascinated. If there was any accuracy whatsoever to what I was hearing, to what John was saying, what on earth had been going on for the previous decade, almost decade, of public discourse about AIDS? I had no way of knowing whether the statements which were clearly heretical were accurate, sort of accurate, or downright wrong. But as I began to ask myself the what if question, another question logically followed. How in fact had the HIV hypothesis come to be so quickly and firmly lodged in the Western imagination? Why had I never heard these kinds of arguments before? Why, why had I just assumed that what I had heard about AIDS was necessarily true? Even to pose that question felt curious for a moment, because by definition, one was problematizing something which had been presented for years as totally unproblematic. The only way to find an answer to these questions was to go back to the beginning. So I set out to try and find out for myself. As a non-scientist, I started to read. We're all very familiar with the origin of the age of AIDS, of how towards the end of 1979, Joel Wiseman, an LA physician, noticed a small group of young gay men who were suffering from illnesses which by all conventional theory, they should not have been, in particular the fact that they had PCP. The histories of this time tell us something else about the patients. The five subjects all used poppers on a regular basis, and one was an intravenous drug user. The CDC at the time suggested, quote, the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis and candidiasis. That statement was June the 5th, 1981. The time of AIDS had begun, sort of. The real beginning of the age, uh, the age of AIDS, in my view, was April 24, 1984, when Margaret Heckler, U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, stood up before a huge audience of journalists to announce that Dr. Robert Gallo and his colleagues at the National Cancer Institute had isolated a new virus, proved that it was a cause of AIDS, were putting the finishing touches to a test that would be made available in November and would have vaccine ready within two years. The site problem, of course, as everyone in this room knows, is those were birth faced lies. But then this was Ronald Reagan's America. He was up for re-election, was under considerable pressure to do something about this emerging epidemic. The flavor of the moment is captured by Hackler's heckless comments to the throng of journalists. Today we add another miracle to the long honor roll of American medicine and science. Today's discovery represents a triumph of science over a dreaded disease. Those who have disparaged the scientific search, those who said we weren't doing enough, have not understood how sound, solid, significant medical research proceeds. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> this is Margaret Heckler. What the journalists were hearing, but were in no way able to question and which they would relate to their readers, viewers, and listeners around the world over the coming days, months, and years was the orthodoxy of AIDS. What you all know. AIDS does not occur in the absence of HIV infection, and HIV infection is a necessary and sufficient condition for causing AIDS. Whenever I lecture about this to students, who actually are a very interesting receptive audience, they like to hear counter theses, um, Whenever I lecture about this, I show video footage of the Heckler press conference and freeze frame it and ask my students or whoever else I'm talking to what they see. The answer is obvious. Dozens of microphones uh, feeding her words across the globe. On March the 24th, AIDS was a mystery. On March the 25th, it was a truism. The effect of the press conference was immediate and extraordinarily powerful in determining the parameters of all future debates about AIDS. The words virus, cause, AIDS became inseparably linked, utterly unquestioned by all but the most marginal media. To give you a sense of the force of the orthodoxy, 
I'd like to refer to a fascinating piece of work by one of my doctoral students, Denny Wilkins, who's now gone on to a successful academic career as a media studies person himself. He decided to interrogate a database of 37 major newspapers uh, in the US and the UK. Denny searched for the number of stories in which the phrase AIDS virus was employed, a phrase which he correctly took as representing the notion of causality within the AIDS thesis. In 1984, there were just 31 mentions of the phrase, but by 1991, it was appearing in more than 3,000 stories a year in these 37 papers. By 1993, there had in fact been 20,024 uses of the term. Of countervailing theories, none. None. My point here, this is not, my point here is, the thing that strikes me is that the narrative about AIDS was laid down very, very early on and we've never quite escaped it. In fact, we've not never quite escaped it, we've never escaped it. Denny then had a look at how Mr. Gallo, Dr. Gallo, he of the Congressional Inquiry, had furred. He found alongside, uh, alongside the name of Gallo hundreds of references um, to him which attach phrases such as noted, superstar, famed, <laughs> vindication, significant strides, the one scientific hero, <laughs> brilliant, dynamic, pioneering researcher who discovered or co-discovered the AIDS virus, Gallows' virus and so on. Here was a pitch perfect example of how public discourse is shaped the construction of a way of seeing AIDS that was not open to questioning either by the media or any ordinary citizen, certainly. Science and Mrs. Heckler had uttered, and we would believe, because while there were other ways of seeing HIV AIDS, it was almost instantly nigh impossible to find a place in the public square to make those arguments, and denied that place for developing arguments for funding to support research to engage these competing theories empirically. Counter theses had in effect been declared to have no, important, uh, no importance and therefore no news value and therefore no coverage, which would therefore confirm, confirm the lack of news value. What became troubling to me as I started to look into the arguments I'd heard John Lauritsen make, um, as I looked into it through his, through his writings, through Professor Drewsberg's writings, the commentaries of Dave Rasnick and so on, I realized with a certain um, horror and anger that here were serious thinkers and researchers who were being utterly marginalized, attacked, and condemned as heretics. My point here is, one doesn't need to be a scientist to recognize people with talent. And it was manifestly the case to me that here were people with very serious talent who were being shoved aside. That, in my book, was wrong, for reasons I'll come back to, I'll come to at the end. I also realized that the HIV orthodoxy was perhaps a rather good example of the fact that it is perfectly possible to have internally consistent, even clever, debates that begin with a shared premise and continue to do so if that premise is never questioned, never problematized. If, however, the initial premise is flawed, misplaced, erroneous, or downright crazy, all the subsequent sophisticated discourse in the world will not negate the flaw, the misplacement, the error, or the craziness. So the case for the extent of the focus on AIDS, particularly in terms of the money being spent, depends totally on the credibility of that initial premise. If that is incorrect, then everything else has been at best misguided, at worst a distracting waste of time. However, the orthodoxy was established and other contrarian views outlawed in a Gallo-led Reagan-fed scientific coup d'etat. How did it work? One of the most potent ways in which the public can be led to see something this way rather than that is when a narrative enters popular culture and becomes taken as a given, something that any right-thinking person absolutely knows to be true. Stories, claims, declarations of fact, here, there, and everywhere, the same story told countless times in countless venues, on radio and television, in magazines, 
movies, in the conversation in the pub or the restaurant, around the water cooler, 